Authentic is sponsored in whole by Voice of Prophecy. In, in some ways, it's like all of us are sitting on death row because, well, the big clock of life just keeps on ticking, and at any moment, death is going to come and get you from your jail cell. And because of that, there are people who think that even trying to live a good life at all for even a few moments is kind of pointless. That's what we're going to look at on today's edition of Authentic. Welcome to Authentic. Sean Boonstra explores real existential questions about the meaning of your life and how you can live a genuine human existence. Listen every week right here on this station or on your favorite podcatcher. Here's Sean with this week's episode of Authentic. They say that a writer really only has a few words to get your attention, to pull you into their book. So when it comes to captivating readers, I think I'd have to give first prize to the French philosopher Albert Camus because, well, this is how he opens his famous book, The Myth of Sisyphus. Just just listen to this. There is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. All the rest, whether or not the world has three dimensions, whether the mind has nine or twelve categories, comes afterwards. Well, if that kind of writing doesn't get your attention, I doubt anything would. This is essentially the same question that Shakespeare asks in Hamlet when his lead character is contemplating taking his own life and delivers those really famous lines, to be or not to be, that is the question. What Camus' book really does is explore the value and the meaning of life. What's driving him to think about suicide at the very beginning of the book is a problem he describes as the absurdity of life. Sooner or later, he argues, you're going to realize that life in this universe has absolutely no meaning and the process of living is, well, absurd. It just doesn't mean anything. Here's one of the ways he describes this sudden moment of awareness where you realize the world you're living in is just ludicrous. And he does this by describing a man in a phone booth. He writes, at certain moments of lucidity, he's talking about watching people and suddenly becoming aware that, well, they look kind of ridiculous. At certain moments of lucidity, the mechanical aspect of their gestures, their meaningless pantomime makes silly everything that surrounds them. A man is talking on the telephone behind a glass partition. You cannot hear him, but you see his incomprehensible dumb show. You wonder why he is alive. Now, to an extent, I think we can all identify with that feeling. Most of us at some point are suddenly captivated by something rather ordinary. Say, I don't know, like a group of people eating lunch at the counter of a diner. And as we're watching them, the usual structure that our brain gives to that sight suddenly falls away and the whole thing just starts to look kind of silly. I mean, maybe in our imagination, we suddenly compare the crowd at the counter to a group of cows with their noses in a feeding trough or Maybe the up and down movement of their heads suddenly reminds us of those little plastic drinking birds that bob up and down on the edge of a glass. Whatever it is that you imagine, the scene in front of you suddenly looks very silly and it begins to lose meaning. It's it's a little bit like what happens when you pick a word from the English language, like the word book, and you say it over and over and over out loud until it no longer sounds like a real word and it becomes nothing more than this silly, arbitrary sound. Those are the moments when you begin to suspect that maybe the world around you isn't quite as structured as you've been led to believe. And you start to suspect that the only reason you ever thought it was structured is because your brain has been imposing some kind of structure on it. Now, for most of us, that's just a passing moment, a mere glitch in the fabric of reality. But for Albert Camus, it signaled something really, really important. He thought of it as this big eureka moment, a moment when you finally wake up and realize that life is utterly pointless. He says there's no future reward, there is no higher purpose, and there is no real point to the exercise of living. Which brings him to the subject of suicide. If life is truly pointless and all of us are just waiting for the executioner to come and end our time on earth, then why not just get on with it? What's the point of prolonging your agony? Now, just just in case we're tempted to think that Camus was actually suicidal, he wasn't. In fact, he argues that suicide would be the act of a weak-minded person. 
And somehow he wasn't convinced that you need meaning to make the most of this life. Even though a lot of psychologists today do suspect that meaning might be the deepest need that all of us have. Camus would argue, though, that meaning is an illusion. So if you're going to enjoy your life, you have to find another way to do that. Most of us, he says, are living for the future, for the hope of reward, a, a, a reward, he says, that's never going to come. And to the way, his way of thinking, living for hope, that's an act of escapism, just like suicide is. It's a way of avoiding your present, which is bad, he says, because, well, the present is all you have. So the best you can do, he argues, is to live in the present and make the most of it. Just enjoy being alive. Quit living for the idea that someday the universe will actually reward you for your efforts because all of us are headed for oblivion and nobody's going to remember you after you're dead. Albert Camus had a background in theater and so he compares the absurdity of life to an actor who is famous one moment and then forgotten the next. I'll let him describe his own way of thinking. He writes, the actor's realm is that of the fleeting. Of all kinds of fame, it is known his is the most ephemeral. So in other words, it just doesn't last very long. At least this is said in conversation. But all kinds of fame are ephemeral. From the point of Sirius, that's the dog star, Goethe's work in 10,000 years will be dust and his name forgotten. Perhaps a handful of archaeologists will look for evidence as to our era. Now, as Camus himself admits, that's hardly original. Millions of people have wondered about the apparent pointlessness of life. And it's a thought that even appears in the pages of the Bible, most notably in the book of Ecclesiastes. I mean, just, just listen to this from Ecclesiastes chapter 2. And I think I'm going to read quite a bit of this because in some ways it does sort of parallel the point that Camus makes. This is comparing the lives of a wise man and a fool. And the writer notices that at the end of the road, both of these people suffer exactly the same fate. It says, the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I myself perceive that the same event happens to them all. So I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. And why was I then more wise? So, so in other words, he's saying, what's the point of investing in myself? It continues. Then I said in my heart, this also is vanity. For there is no more remembrance of the wise man than the fool forever, since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die? As the fool. Therefore I hated life, because the work that was done under the sun was distressing to me, for all is vanity and grasping for the wind." pretty depressing stuff, at least if you leave it right there and quit reading. And I, I'm going to go back and look at it again in just a moment, but I've got to take a break right now. So don't go away because I'll come back to make you feel a little less depressed. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers, but that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. Sign up at BibleStudies.com today and start your journey of discovery. This is Authentic with Sean Boonstra and The Voice of Prophecy. If there was one word that I personally would use to describe Albert Camus, it would be nihilism. And I know there are lots of people who reject that label for Camus because he expended considerable energy trying to insist that he was actually fighting nihilism. He would describe himself as an absurdist, which means that he recognized the absurdity of life and he chose to fight it instead of accept it. But for me personally, well, the distinction between Camus and somebody like Friedrich Nietzsche is small enough that I'm not convinced he doesn't deserve the nihilist label. And I know some of his fans are screaming right now because Camus himself rejected the label. I guess I'll just have to live with that. But I do want to get back to this idea that human existence is absurd. If it is, the question is, what are you going to do about that? What you need to do, Albert Camus suggests, is just live in the present. Enjoy the fact that you're alive and rebel against the absurdity of the universe. Forget about the future, forget about the past, and just live for the present. 
And then he goes on to describe what that might look like. He introduces three different characters who live an absurdist lifestyle. One of them is a seducer, a sexually promiscuous person. Another one is an actor, and the third one is a conqueror. What each of these people need to do, Camus suggests, is maximize the experience of living by engaging in the maximum number of experiences. The seducer, he says, needs to seduce as many people as possible. The actor needs to take on as many different roles as he can. And the conqueror needs to engage in as many conflicts as possible, because by embracing the challenge, the thrill of the present, you're actually maximizing your life. It doesn't need to mean anything. It just needs to happen. And it doesn't really matter if you win or lose, because what you've done is live in the present and just enjoyed it. Now, I've got to admit, I have made a little bit of a caricature out of this, because all I have is 28 minutes and 30 seconds to summarize the work of a philosopher, but that's essentially what he says. And then he introduces a fourth character, the mythological character of Sisyphus. As you probably remember from school, Sisyphus was condemned by the chief god Zeus, and he was forced to push the same massive stone up a mountain over and over and over for the rest of eternity. He would struggle to push it to the top, and then it would roll back down to the bottom, forcing him to just start all over. It was a pointless task, and Camus compared that to the struggle of daily living. You and I, he says, are going to put in hard time on this earth, and in the end, it's all going to be for nothing. Here's the way he describes it. He says, You have already grasped that Sisyphus is the absurd hero. He is as much through his passions as through his torture. His scorn of the gods, his hatred of death, and his passion for life won him that unspeakable penalty in which the whole being is exerted toward accomplishing nothing. The torture of life comes from those moments when we realize that everything we do, to use the words of Ecclesiastes, is vanity. All your efforts seem to be in vain. So the only choice people have, at least from Camus' perspective, is to accept absurdity and find a level of contentment as you rebel against it. The struggle itself toward the heights, Camus argues, is enough to fill a man's heart. I don't know about you, but I'm not happy with that. And this is where I have to part company with this man. Not because the struggle of life can't be enjoyable, but because it doesn't seem to match reality as much as Camus thinks it does. For this guy, those occasional moments when life seems pointless, he thinks that's the sum total of reality. For me, those are more like glitches in the process of understanding reality. The vast majority of people do find meaning in life, and, and it seems to me that we might want to apply Occam's razor here. The most obvious explanation, Occam argued, is probably the right one. What you, what you don't want to do is build your perception of the universe on the exception on a brief moment of confusion. What you want to do is build it the way that the vast majority of people have understood the nature of existence for a really, really long time. Occam's razor suggests that most people are probably right about life. It means something. The confusing parts of life are not the rule, they're the exception. Now, before I protest any further, let me underline a few things I think Camus got right, because there are points of intersection between his absurdist approach to life and the way the Bible describes the nature of human existence. We've already seen how the book of Ecclesiastes admits quite openly that life can often seem pointless. But that's just a tiny sliver of the biblical worldview, and I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. But for now, let me give some credit where credit is probably due. To some extent, Camus is right. All you really have is the present, and I'll be the first to admit that some Christians really downplay the value of living in the present because they put all of their emphasis on the afterlife. Now, to be sure, the Bible does present an afterlife and a future reward as major reasons to go on striving against the hardship of this world. And I really do believe that someday you and I are going to answer for the present. That's going to happen in the future. But that doesn't mean this present doesn't matter. Let me, let me show you what I mean. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says something that I think more people should probably take to heart. He's talking about worry, which is really the art of borrowing trouble from the future. And 
Here's what Jesus says. He says, Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So, on the one hand, Jesus does point us forward to the kingdom of God, which is a reward that you can look forward to. But at the same time, he underlines the value of the present, and he counsels you to live in it, because all you really have is today. So, in some tiny way, we can find an intersection between Albert Camus and the Bible. Far too many people in this world live neurotically because their entire existence is based on the future and they're missing the life they have today. So what some people practice in this world is something called mindfulness, which is really just paying attention to your life as it presents itself right now. And we know that just learning to live in the present can bring relief to people who suffer from crippling anxiety. Now, to be clear, there is a version of mindfulness that Christians tend to avoid because it comes loaded with a lot of, well, contrary religious ideas. But as we've just seen, there is also a biblical way to be mindful. Here's another example where the Bible underlines the value of living in the present, albeit in kind of a roundabout way. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul is discussing the importance of the resurrection of Christ, and here's what he says. He writes, And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So you'll, you'll notice that Paul is arguing against the idea that death is actually final forever because Christ has promised the resurrection of the dead. And the fact that Jesus rose from the dead means that you and I have something to look forward to. If that isn't true, Paul says, then the dead have simply perished, which is exactly what Camus used to preach. Then Paul says that if we only have hope in Christ for this lifetime, then we should be pitied. Now, if you look at that carefully, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, if we come to the conclusion that this life is all we have, that's a really depressing thought. But at the same time, I want you to notice that Paul does say that we have hope in Christ in this lifetime. Of course, Camus would argue that hope is ridiculous, and what you're hoping for isn't going to happen because death is just going to come for you at any moment now. Paul does not think hope is ridiculous, and reminds us that we have hope both in the future and now in this lifetime. Now, I do have to go and take another quick break, but don't go away, because I want to come back and quickly examine some real problems with the myth of Sisyphus. I'll be right back after this. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top-quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages. Your whole family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. Check it out today at discoverymountain.com. This is Authentic with Sean Boonstra and the Voice of Prophecy. You know, there, there's one more little area of agreement I think I can find between Camus and the Bible, and that's Camus' insistence on learning contentment. In his mind, the endless task of Sisyphus became better when he learned to be content. And that's actually an idea that Paul taught as well. In his letter to the Philippians, here's what Paul says. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need." You know, that's probably great advice for one of the most entitled generations to ever live on this planet. You and I have more stuff, we have a higher standard of living than any generation in history, and yet we find ourselves dissatisfied. Our appetite for self-indulgence apparently is a bottomless pit, and the only cure for that is contentment. 
You know, one of the things I like about Camus is just how quotable he is. Back in college, I found myself enjoying his books because he really does have a gift for stating his ideas in a way that forces you to stop and think. And it was obvious to me that his early childhood, which was fatherless, and the tough time he had navigating the world as a kid, and the fact that his marriage failed in less than a year, and his co career ambitions were ruined by tuberculosis, and well, all of this stuff probably contributed to his rather bleak outlook on life. And to be sure, sometimes a hard life brings out the best in people because it does seem to generate a level of creativity. But what I don't enjoy about Camus is the solution. I, I know that some people find what he writes comforting, but I sure don't. In fact, I find some of the implications horrific. The only way to fight meaninglessness, he says, is to expand your experiences and prolong your life as much as possible. Living in the present is all you've got, so maximize it. So here's the problem with that. It's really hard to maintain any kind of morality when your goal is to maximize the present. I mean, let's just consider the case of the seducer, the person that Camus argued had learned to be an absurdist. The goal of the seducer, remember, is to seduce as many people as possible. And he uses Don Juan as his example, a man who just lives to satiate his physical appetite. But what that leaves you with is a much higher propensity for heightened selfishness. If all we have is now, then why not adopt Aleister Crowley's maxim, which says, do what you will? I mean, some noble philosopher might be able to cobble together a decently moral life, but how are the vast majority of people going to respond to Camus' way of thinking? They're going to respond like the seducer. And what the seducer does in the real world is leave behind a trail of hurt people. Sexual relationships, it turns out, are not just physical acts. They have a deep emotional component. And what happens when somebody uses other people for personal satisfaction is that they cause significant damage to somebody else. What you get is a drunken frat boy who sees a girl as nothing but a conquest. And in the act of intimacy, the human body emits high levels of oxytocin, a hormone that bonds us to other people. It's actually called the love hormone. And it's the same chemical that surfaces in greater quantities when a mother is breastfeeding a newborn. It creates a deep emotional connection and it teaches you to trust people. So what happens when the seducer uses other people is that he's actually destroying somebody else's capacity to trust. And he's also missing out on the significant rewards that come from long-term committed relationships. Camus might not want you to focus on the future, but I can tell you after nearly 30 years of marriage that the future is well worth investing in. As he wrestled with all these ideas, Camus tried very hard to cling to some kind of morality, but personally, I do find this approach kind of empty. I mean, he wants us to rebel, to push back against absurdity, but you've got to wonder, what's the point of pushing back? Because wouldn't that also be meaningless? Wouldn't you also just be pushing back against nothing? I honestly think that Camus was a little bit scared of his own conclusions, and he tried very hard to make it seem like living for the present is enough. But you really have to wonder what the world would be like if everybody just did that. Now, before we're finished, I want to offer you a biblical suggestion for why the world so often seems meaningless and life can feel so pointless. You find the beginnings of an answer in the opening words of Psalm chapter 8, where the Bible says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. According to this, the universe exists to display the glory of the Creator. It goes on in verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? I would argue that one of the key reasons we find the universe absurd or meaningless is because We've convinced ourselves that the universe answers to us. But according to the Bible, the universe answers to the Creator. And what you and I have done is detach ourselves from reality, and we've placed ourselves rather narcissistically at the center of attention. Then when the universe doesn't respond like we hope, we begin to think that our existence must be absurd. I'll be right back after this. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. 
If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Voice of Prophecy's free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the prophetic mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and the world around you. You can study online or request them by mail. Visit BibleStudies.com and start bringing prophecy into focus today. Welcome back. It's Authentic with Sean Boonstra and the Voice of Prophecy. The moment we pulled away from God and we wanted to be the center of the universe's attention, that's the moment that life began to seem pointless. And I'm convinced that's what Camus was witnessing. When we live for self, we run into all kinds of problems because we're asking the universe to answer to us. And it was created to answer to God. In fact, according to the scriptures, you and I were also created to answer to God. In the city of Athens, Paul explains it this way to a group of Greek philosophers. He says to them, For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Detach yourself away from your original design and you're going to stop finding purpose. The self-importance that we insist on leaves us without any importance at all because we were not designed for this. I guess you could say that apart from the Creator, we're like a fish trying to ride a bike. We're using a machine, the universe, that was not designed to glorify us. A self-driven existence where you live for the present often devolves into sheer hedonism, the practice of living for pleasure. And as millions of disillusioned people could tell you, there is a future reward for hedonism, a price that you're going to pay, and it isn't very pleasant. We cannot afford to forget that the present we create right now is going to be our present at some point in the future. And if you ignore the advice of the one who made you, you're probably going to find that future really hard to enjoy. Listen, I'll agree with Camus on this. The answer to a difficult life really is not suicide. There is a point to all this. And at the same time, the answer isn't living for self in the present. A situation where strong people always seem to trample on the weak in pursuit of their own happiness. I can assure you, after sitting with I don't know how many dying people now, that kind of life almost always ends badly. It almost always leads to regret. The real answer is found in discovering the one in whom we live and move and have our being, and understanding that the universe only seems absurd because you and I made it look that way when we pulled away from the real reason for its existence. Living in the present, to some extent, it's a good idea, but that's not all there is. There is a future to look forward to, and there is a point to life, and you'll find them in the pages of this book. Thanks for joining me again this week. I'm Sean Boonstra. You've been listening to Authentic. You've been listening to Authentic, sponsored by Voice of Prophecy. Remember, you can listen every week right here at the same time. And thank you. Authentic is funded by listeners just like you. You can support at voiceofprophecy.com. That's also where you can find all the episodes you missed or where you can listen again. That's voiceofprophecy.com.